Good day, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you to JCC Sunday School is in session where Sunday School matters to God. So Sunday School should matter to us. Our Sunday School lesson for January 19, 2020 will come from the text of 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, verses 22 through 30 and verses 52 and 53. We will be teaching from two different Sunday School books. And as we have always said, they have different subjects, but the same text. The Sunday School book today will, uh, in their respectable will be Townsend's Press based on International Lesson Series. Its topic for this year's Sunday School uh, lesson is Solomon dedication, Solomon's Dedication Prayer. Finally, the last is the Uniform Series International Bible Lesson for Christian Teaching. And the title for this here book is Solomon Seeks God's Blessing. As always, we provide a life application at the end of the lesson. So please stick around and, uh, and get that. We will teach from... Uh, our lesson today from context, observation, interpretation, and application. Let's begin with context. Uh, the context of our lesson today, uh, Solomon prayed a series of prayers uh, as the temple was dedicated to God. We sense that Solomon realized that the temple was useless if, if God did not dwell amongst them and make his presence known in the temple. And now a temple is also useless if God's presence doesn't dwell there in us as well. So we need the presence of God to dwell in us, and we know it dwells by the Holy Spirit. We will see Solomon as we read in this here lesson at the end of the chapter. He prayed generally and specific prayers for God to manifest himself. We will find Solomon praying for this gracious, uh, the graciousness of God towards his people and also to answer uh, their prayers. Uh, God, this here lesson is a, a prayer that is focused uh, on uh, God and, and God's uh, provision, his mercy, his grace uh, for the people. And we know Christians and we know that prayer changes things. So we uh, need to harness today, if you will, this here prayer and, and what it can mean to our lives as well. So as we get into our lesson, let's begin at verse 22. As Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. We see Solomon performing what usually a priestly, again, is a priestly duty. Uh, Solomon has been doing a lot of things that are uh, priests would normally do, but we see Solomon doing them here. And as we go through this here, let's observe Solomon's uh, uh, actions and what he is actually doing. The first thing we notice is Solomon's reverent posture before God. Solomon is standing on uh, the, the the altar, if you will, which is raised. It's the, uh, as, as Solomon built this temple, he built a bronze platform that's seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high. It, it, it's important that we understand the significance of this altar so we can understand the reverent posture of Solomon. The place where God received his people's sacrifices it is bronze in color, symbolizing righteous judgment. Uh, Solomon is standing in the place where God shows us he's willing to take our sin and graciously, graciously deal with it himself. It is the very place where atonement occurs. Why? Because men sacrifice for the shedding of the blood. We know that without the shedding of blood, there could be no covering of our sins. He's standing there where the four horns are on the altar, which also is symbolic and represents God's power. It's also significant that we stand that he stood on this altar because it shows us that it is the only way to get to our God. What do I mean by that? The altar, if you came through the gate, the altar is the very first thing you see as you come through that gate. It shows the very first step for a sinful man to approach a holy God was to come uh, through this gate and come before this altar so he could be cleansed by the blood of an innocent creature. Solomon standing there is a reflection of Jesus for he tells us in John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So in previous lesson, it teaches us that the sacrifice, they sacrifice countless amounts of animal to appease God for their sins. We can see the symbolism here of Solomon coming to the Father in a sacrificial, reverent way. 
by standing on the altar, he's coming in a way of atonement. We should always remember we cannot come to God any kind of way. We, 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 there is a way we come before our God. There's a way we come to God. And throughout Scripture, it teaches us. We can find one in Proverbs 14 and 12. says, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that we are supposed to do things. God has mandated how we come before him. We just need to find those things in Scripture. Because if we do it our way, we can make a mess. The text says he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the congregation of Israel. He's showing again. Our leader is showing the example. If the leader realizes if the, if the leader realizes it is, it is only one way to uh, our God, we must follow suit. We too have to go to the altar. We sacrifice and, uh, and make that atonement can only be made with a righteous God. And I'm not saying going and sacrificing animals. I'm not saying and going and taking the blood to make atonement. Jesus Christ has already done that for us. So the only way we can get to the Father is going through Jesus Christ. So as we tie this into our lesson, Solomon stands before the bronze altar, which is again the, the symbol of God's righteous judgment with the horns representing God's power to show reverence. He's there showing reverence to our God. He's there in a, a, a posture of reverence, a posture of honor to show God reverence and honor. Solomon stands that like I said now reverend posture seeking a blessing through prayer for himself and the people. We see that Solomon begins his prayer for a, a blessing standing there. The lesson, like I say, if you go in, the lesson doesn't go over the day. He begins standing. But when you get to verse 54, he ends it kneeling. And, and by, 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 by these verses, 54, he's kneeling in a humble, reverent submission to the Lord God of Israel. But for now, he's standing before this altar of the Lord in the presence of of the assembly with the his hands lifted towards heaven, outstretched in prayer. The Bible says uh, men should always pray, lifting the holy hand. Prayer is essential to a believer. But we see the leader praying here is a powerful thing. Whenever we can get our leadership to pray to our God, to, to lead the lead the congregation. In prayer, that there is a powerful thing. And we need to go in and always encourage our leaders to lead us in prayer. We see the leader, again, stretching out his hands towards heaven. They are stretched out in prayer. When we stretch out our hand, this is a manner during prayer where we are symbolizing a few things, four things. We are saying we are totally dependent upon the Lord. The next thing it says is saying, God, you alone can answer the, the request we are making in prayer. We are also saying when, when you stretch out your hand, you're saying um, that absolutely nothing can be done on our behalf apart from our God. And the last thing it demonstrates that we are submitting ourselves to our God. Solomon was showing God he and all the people are dependent on him. It, we we raise our hands just as a child raises their hand to be picked up when, when they are uh, when they're down to be comforted to be protected to be carried when they are weak we should become accustomed to reaching out for our God's presence. We should be reaching out with our hands up as we pray, reaching out for his blessing, his comfort, his strength for our prayers. We need to be reaching out during our worship service. We need to be reaching out during our praise service. We need to have our hands elevated, reaching for our God because we are dependent upon our God to do a great work in our life. We raise our hands to bless the Lord. As we see in Psalm 63, this symbolizes our gratefulness and joy for the blessing God has given us. As we sing to the Lord, we should raise our hands for he is worthy of all the praise, my brothers and sisters. So we should be lifting holy hands to our God. When we approach God, we must approach him like Solomon did. Solomon shows us he approached God in reverence, 
in awe for the Lord is worthy of praise. So we should approach him. Uh, when we approach him, we must give him the utmost reverence. And, and this is like I say, when we look into our lesson, it's something for us today. We must understand that we cannot come to God any kind of way. We must come with the attitude of humbleness, an attitude of surrender, an attitude of reverence, an attitude of respect, an attitude of, uh, of sovereign worship and praise. We must come to God the way God directs us to come. Amen. Verse 23 and 24 says, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven above or on the earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servant that walk before thee with all their heart who has kept thee kept with thy servant David my father that thou promised him thou speakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine heart as it is this day Solomon here acknowledges the Lord's uniqueness and supremacy Standing there with his outstretched hands up towards heaven, Solomon acknowledged there is no other God like you. There is nothing under the heavens, under the sun. There is nothing that can compare to our God. Our God is the supreme God. Yeah, uh, there are nations who have made many little small G gods and they worship those things, but they are nothing like our God. We serve a one of a kind God. There is only one God it, that is supreme and, and, and God over the earth, over the universe, over the heavens, over every aspect. He is God. And because of his uniqueness, because of his uniqueness, we find that God is all wise. He makes no mistake. God is sovereign. God is in control and free to do whatever he knows and sees as best. God is holy. He's perfectly pure. And there is no sin in our God. God is faithful. He is love. He is mercy. He is eternal. He is just. He is a great God. He is the great I am, meaning that he is whatever we need him to be because God is a God that can supply and answer all our needs. Solomon declares two things about God in, his, in, 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 this, in these verses. We see in this text, he says, God is a covenant keeper. God alone is a covenant keeper. Covenant keeper means he's a promise keeper. He shows us unfailing love as we obey him. And, and we're going to get more into that in a second here. Solomon used the word, walk before thee with all thy heart. To walk before the Lord means to live a life devoted to the Lord. God told Abraham in Genesis 17, 1 and 2, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. We see blameless, the word blameless in that, in that verse that God used with Abraham. Blameless tells us that God is saying he needed to be holy. He needed to be without fault. He needed to walk before God without fault. Solomon in his prayer indicated that God is a promise keeper and shows mercy with his loving kindness to those who live a life devoted and holy before God. That there, what God, when God makes a promise, he keeps his promises. But it's fair to say right here, his promises have a condition on them and they are given to those who are faithful and obedient. See, God's faithful never, his faithfulness never changes. God's faithfulness never changes, but it does have a condition to receive his promises. When, when we go in and he makes a promises, you can almost uh, see that it's always a condition behind that promise. God, God promises to bless obedient people. Obedience gets the promises of God. Solomon states God kept his promise to David by making him to have an everlasting dynasty that his son Solomon would build a temple. By standing there with his hands raised towards heaven, 
having completed the temple, showing God he kept his promise. He shows that our God is faithful again to do what he says he will do. Now, as we get into verse 24, we see that the connection to what God promised and what God performed. God does what he says he will do as he kept his promises he has made to his servant, David. Our lesson doesn't show it, but as we get into verse 25 through 53, it, it begins to outline Solomon's 10 uh, prayer requests. And these prayer requests are for blessings amongst himself and the people uh, of God. We will uh, only cover five of these uh, lessons, uh, uh, blessings today, but we should read the rest of this uh, uh, pericope to go in and really get the gist of all of them. Let's begin with verse 25. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou walk before me. This starts Solomon's request for blessings in his prayer. We can observe, like I say uh, here, that Solomon was a prayer warrior and an intercessory prayer for the people as well. And again, this is a great thing for uh, we as leaders to demonstrate to our congregant. We need to demonstrate that we should take everything, every detail to the Lord in prayer, and we should intercess for others as well. Christ's routine was for intercessing for the people in the New Testament. We constantly saw Christ definitely intercessing for his disciples. Christ intercessed for us. He came in and intercessed and intervened on our behalf. And if we allow the Holy Spirit, that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to intercess and intervene, to come in and provide comfort, to come in when we can't say what we need to say. It speaks for us. When we can't come in and get it out, it'll grow for us as well up until God. This is one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. This is a strong lesson in seeking the Lord through prayer. If you really uh, want to go in and see how to come in and ask for God's blessings, ask for how God can come in and bless you and your family or your church or your nation, your community, your world. This is a great uh, model here that uh, Solomon says before us. We see in this verse, Solomon's first request is that God would keep all his promises. And what is these promises that 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 God was to keep? And and we, let, let, let's look at those. You can find those in Second Samuel seven one through sixteen. Uh, you can find some of those uh, promises. And that one of those promises was that David's throne would be established forever. Solomon requests that the legacy and dynasty of David's lineage would be established forever. As God had promised. As we look at Solomon's request that David dynasty be established forever, this is a great segue to see what promises we can attach to our prayer request uh, to, towards God for our family dynasty. It could be for the comfort and presence of God with our family and that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It, it could be Lord, uh, for, for the Lord's protection over your family, uh, your family dynasty, and that no weapon formed against your family shall ever prosper. It could be any promise in the Bible that you want to attach to your family line for generations to come. This is a great segue in how we can go in and bless our family using the word of God in his promises that he's already made. And then you want to go and make a covenant with God that it remains on your family for life, for, for eternity. It could be any promise, like I say, that you want to attach to your family line for generations to come. We see that God has assured David's line will reign forever, and we realize that He will that this will come true through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, is, as you look into Matthew, when it talks about the lineage, we see Jesus Christ uh, is in there because of the his, his natural birth, uh, being Mary and Joseph. Joseph is from the line of David. And we know Joseph is not his father. Uh, uh, father, 
but it allows us to see because of the lineage and how things come in that David will maintain that lineage, that, that King uh, figure on the throne for eternity. But if we go back and I want us to go back in that verse uh, again, I want us to notice it so that thy children take heed, take heed to their way that they walk before me as thou has walked before me. Solomon here, demonstrates again that God's promises come with a condition. In giving the promise to David, the Lord lays a condition on it. This would be the case only if David's son took heed, which means to pay close attention to walk before the Lord. We learned early that this needed to be blameless and living a life devoted to the Lord. If they did that, the promise would be fulfilled. Solomon must have understood this and requested God to honor it as he would uh, do his part uh, as well to, uh, to walk before the Lord as his father walked. David's son had to obey God if they wanted to uh, rule. His lineage had to obey God in order to rule upon the throne. And we know the line of David fell in this until Christ came. Who came? Uh, who comes uh, from the line of David again? He will be the ruler forever. Uh, they started out. Solomon started out well, but we know the rest of the story. And he came up short. God's promises should guide our desires, and should also serve as a foundation and direction for all our hopes and ex- expectations in our prayer life and from our God. Verse 26, and now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant, my father. The next request for blessing that God will fulfill his word, which he promised to David. We find these promises made again in 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 16. As we go in and break these down, let, let, let's, let's look at these promises that were made to David. God promised David and his descendants will be king. God also says he would choose one of David's son to be king. We know that became Solomon. Uh, God chose Solomon. We said God will make him a strong ruler and a great king and no one will be able to take uh, his kingdom away. This was the promise that God made to David reference Solomon. And this is the thing I believe that Solomon is really trying to go in and hard harp on in this here point. He wanted in his young age, because Solomon started out as king in a very young age, and he wanted to be a, a strong ruler, a great king, and he didn't need, he didn't want anyone to come in and take over his kingdom. So he, he, he's asking God for this blessing to honor that promise. God also said he will choose David's son to build his temple. And David C we will be the son of God. We know that that, that comes in uh, when Christ come, came on the scene. God had fulfilled all at the time except David's seed being the son of God. He hadn't uh, fulfilled uh, David's seed being the son of God. We again can see our God is a promise keeper. Man, I am so glad that God is a promise keeper, that he would adhere to what he say he would do. He He will do what he says he do. Man, aren't you glad that God keeps his word? Even when we don't keep our word, God is a covenant keeper. He is a promise keeper who stands on the things he said he would do. And again, if we don't do what he said, there is a condition that will hinder us from the blessings of God. Verse 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heavens and the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built? Solomon asks a question here. Will God dwell on earth? Solomon demonstrates that nothing can contain our God. Our God is too big for the earth. He's too big for the heavens. He's too big for anything. Nothing can contain our God. Our God is 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 so mighty, so 
magnificent, so glorious that nothing can contain him. The temple cannot contain God, even though his presence came in. But that there is that not the fullness of God. We learn in verse 29 that the temple was built for the name of God. God honored it again with his presence. The fact that nothing can contain our God lets us know that there is no problem too big. There is no mountain too high. There is nothing that can overwhelm our God. So if we are on God's side, God can deal and handle anything that we come in contact with. Solomon now is going to give us four pleas. These are the pleas for blessings. These are the things that he's going to plead as we begin this here 28 verse. Let's read. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his and to his supplication. O Lord, my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thou servant prayed before thee today. Notice in this verse. Solomon the king recognized himself as a mere servant of God. We are all servants of God. No matter the title, we never get bigger than our God. We are all called to be servants. Christ said, if anybody want to lead, he must serve first. This is the humble act of submission and respect on the leader's part here. That every believer should have for our God. Solomon respectfully asks for mercy and for God to hear his cry. We know mercy is that it's God's loving kindness. And he's asking here for God's loving kindness and for God to hear his cry. Nothing but respect and honor for his God. And we I have gotten to a place, my brothers and sisters, where we get slacked in that. We get so comfortable. We get so ritualistic that we, we lose sight of every time that we come before God. We should come in a manner of respect. We should come in a manner of honor. We should know that we're coming before a holy God. And the way God dealt with unholiness, the way God dealt with the priest, if he came into the Holy of Holies and he wasn't right with God, God would strike him down right there in the spot. And I say again, we lose sight of this. We lose sight that we are not doing what God has asked us to do. And we need to get to a place where we reverence God, that we honor him, that we respect him and that we humbly submit to him, knowing that he is complete holiness and need to be treated with the respect that he deserves. Again, we see Solomon in this first plea asking God to send mercy. Send mercy as he hears the cries of his people. Verse 29 says that thine eyes may be open towards this house night and day even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayers which thy servant shall make towards this place. Solomon makes his desire known. He desires the favor and compassion of God to be bestowed on the house of God, this here new temple. He, he, he wants it to be under God's protection. Notice Solomon indicates God's name will be on the temple. God's name is a symbol of endorsement. It is a symbol of his power being present in the temple. When you hear the name of God and when anything that we do, that's why Jesus Christ said, if you ask it in my name, you, Jesus Christ said, I'm endorsing what you say. So it also means that when we ask it in his name, we must make sure that it is Opera, whatever we're asking for, is in accordance to his will. And that's one of the things, again, we miss out on. We think that we go and put that rubber stamp in Jesus' name, we should be able to get whatever we ask. But we may be asking for things that are outside the will of God for our lives. Back to the lesson. God's name, like I said, is a symbol of his endorsement and a symbol of his power. Second Chronicles 7 and 16 said, I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This is the answer 
to Solomon's prayer. This right here is the answer that when Solomon made the request, if you go and read Second Chronicles, if we can remember the uh, Chronicles and the Kings uh, kind of parallel one another on, on, on a lot of the kings and a lot of their lives, what they want. This is the answer. God said, I've, I, I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my, my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. God's name is the embodiment of his presence. It is his glory. It is his grace. We go in. We don't give God the true reverence. We just say God. And there are many little G gods. But God has a name. Yahweh. Elohim. We, we use it in the English. I am that I am. God's name has power and authority. And we should reverence the name of God. The Jewish uh, uh, nation back then reverenced his name so much they wouldn't even say it because they thought his name had that had that much honor, had that much clout that they were uh, they refused to pronounce it. So that's why we see Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D to go in to to signify a God. They use phrase like Adonai. Uh, Elohim, those type of names to go in to, 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 to reverence who God really, really is. Verse 30 says, And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and thy people Israel, and when they shall pray towards this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, when thou hearest forgive. Solomon is kind of making a spiritual contract here. If, if you look at it, he, he's making a covenant with his God, a, a spiritual contract that when the people will look to the hills from which cometh their help, God who is in heaven will hear their prayers and forgive their sins. It, it goes back when we see in Second Chronicles 7 and 14, God heard the contract and he agreed uh, to it, but it had, had, it had to be done with a condition. He says, if my people, who are called by my name will humble themselves. Here starts the condition. You had to humble yourself. You had to pray. You had to seek his face. And you had to turn from wicked ways. It says, then, here's God's promise. I'll hear from heaven. Forgive sins and heal the land. We always must understand that God has a requirement on our part to do what God wants us to do. So this third plea for God is to hear the prayers of his people. And the fourth and final plea that we're going over today is for God to forgive his people. Today in our society, today, my brothers, we need our prayers heard. We need to be operating in a right relationship with God because sin hinders our prayer life. So we need to operate in a right relationship with God. So our prayers are heard and in our prayer, forgiveness should always be uh, 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 spoken over our lives, over our families our churches and communities, over our government, over our nation, over this world, because there's always sin lurking at every corner. And we may be victimized with the sins of omission or the sins of commission. Either way, we still need God's forgiveness. We know that the blood of Jesus covers us and allows us to be forgiven and our slates are wiped clean. But Jesus, but God said, I mean, First John 1 and 9 said, if we come in and confess our sin, said he is just to forgive us. And we need forgiveness in this land. Verse 52 and 53, it says that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance as they spake by the hand of Moses, thy servant, when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. 
this year, technically, if you went through the the, the sequence, would have been a tenth blessing. Uh, in this fifty second fifty second verse, it is that God would answer every prayer that Solomon and the people ask. He wanted God to open his eyes to all the pleas of the people to listen to them whenever they cried out, Lord God Almighty. Solomon is asking for the blessing of the Lord to be on Israel. He's asking for the blessing to be on the people of God. The blessing was for God's grace and mercy to be poured out in, uh, on the people when they came to God and cried to him in the times of need. Solomon, like anyone else, knows that the people were going to go astray. If you read through those blessings that he had, the people were going to do things, and punishment was going to come from our Heavenly Father. Judgment was going to come as a result of it. But if the people look to the hill, if the people look back to the temple, if the people look to their God in a time of need, Solomon was saying, please, Lord, hear our plea, hear our cry. In that 53rd verse, we see that in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, 19, 5, that God promises his people that they shall be his chosen vessel, it reads. It says, now if you obey me fully, there we go again. Obedience is a necessity. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, obedience, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. We see this promise again, my brothers and sisters, has a condition attached to it. And that condition is obedience. And we fall in that same thing today. We are to remain obedient to the kingdom of God. i, I done a study and, and, and did a Bible study on covenant relationship and uh, you've heard me say it earlier in this here uh, uh, broadcast where I am said that there are in the covenant relationship God has a part to do and we have a part to do God's part is to be a uh, provider and protector our part is to be loyal and obedient and this is why I explained to uh, one of our uh, parishioners, uh, congregants or whatnot, it, it's important. They ask the question, well, why does God hate uh, idolatry so much? Because you're showing this loyalty to him. God requires us to be loyal to him. He requires us to be obedient to what he's promised us. If the obedience is absent, the full benefit of the promise of God cannot be expected. We need to be obedient in order to get the promises. He was asking God to keep his eyes and ears up open for the pleas of the people and their king. God, Solomon realized as he was trying to bless the people, in order for them to be blessed, they had to have a relationship with God in order to, for him to give them the blessings that they need. So when the relationship was broken, when the relationship was severed, they had a way back to their God if they looked to the hills and prayed to God, repented, and asked God to bring them through. Just go back to, like I say, the Second Chronicles uh, 7 and 14. When we're doing our part, God will surely do his part. Our life application from this lesson today, which was really a great lesson today. It really has some great insight and great parts in our lesson. But our life application of this lesson is that our God is a promise keeper. We can learn that our God is a promise keeper. He keeps his promises towards those who walk before him blameless and in obedience. Uh, that he, uh, we need to learn the significance of walking a faithful life. The book of Ephesians uh, talks a lot about uh, the walk. Uh, Paul did a great job talking about the walk. If you want to know how to really walk uh, with God and walk before God blameless, uh, the book of Ephesians is a good book 
to start your, your quest. I'm not saying it's the in all be all, but it's a good book to start your quest and how to walk uh, humbly before your God. It also teaches in this lesson that we can ask God for blessings for our dynasty, uh, uh, our nation, and we can do this here through intercessory prayer. Prayer is important. We know that prayer changes things, and we can uh, make this happen through prayer. We also learn the leader should be a prayer, uh, a prayer warrior, and he should be praying for the well-being of his people, and ask God to be uh, attentive to the prayers of his people. Uh, because as a leader, we know that the congregants are going to kind of go and walk uh, away. At times, they're going to slip and, and and fall. And not just them, we as well. We're going to slip and fall. But that's why I believe Solomon asked for the prayers for himself as the, and, and the people. So we need to have ask the people to, tell, to cover us as we cover them. And, and that way we don't miss anything. Everything will be covered on all ends. We see prayers pleading with God's mercy and Forgiveness. We need God's. We need to plead for the mercy of God. We need to plead for God to forgive us. And not just us, we, as we intercess, plead for God to have mercy and forgiveness on others as well. Verse 30 teaches that God honors spiritual contract. When we align ourselves with the will and the word of God and we do it God's way, God will honor our covenant, our spiritual contract that we're making. And I think we need to make spiritual contracts over our families, over our kids, over our legacy, over our dynasty. We need to have that contract to ask God to be there for us in the time because we're not going to be around here forever. And we need our kids to be covered in the blood of the Lamb. And finally, if the obedience is absent, the full benefit of the promise of God cannot be expected. We learn today obedience is a necessity. And it should be ever present in our lives and at the forefront of our lives doing our work for God. Well, my brothers and sisters, that there was another great lesson this week. We have finished uh, our lesson for the day. Uh, I want to say again, thank you for uh, tuning in and, and coming in and, and, and supporting us in our efforts to really try to go in and bring the word out, bring a life application to the word of God through our Sunday schools. So I would ask if you would, if you like what you get, if you're really enjoying what you get, let us hear from you. We ask that you go in, leave comments at the bottom. We ask you that you subscribe to us. We're going to try to be here every Wednesday giving you a word uh, so that you can be able to prepare yourself for those, this week's uh, lesson that's coming up. And also, like I said, like us. And you should subscribe, hit the bell so that way you can be notified when new lessons come on board. We are doing things and we're trying to do them in the admonition and honoring God in our efforts. I am Minister Harrison, and I just want to go in and just show you that Minister H., is a servant of God. I'm not trying to go in and be any uh, 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 anything more than what God wants me to be. So I'm asking you, support us. Come out and meet us here every Wednesday. Same time, same channel. Be blessed.